What you're seeing at the moment, uh, we have the Die Hard group, and we're portraying the British infantry soldier from the 1870s at the time of the Civil Wars. This is the sort of kit and equipment that you would have seen worn during the Battle of Isan Luan at Rourke's Drift, which of course are the two most famously known engagements. And we are actually portraying the 24th Regiment. You notice the column numbers are showing 24th. Uh, we're using all the original kit and equipment that would have been available at the time, the Martini Henry rifle. Uh, and what you see me dressed in here is just fighting order kit where I've got my water bottle, which holds about a pint and a quarter of water, my ration bag, which would carry my little bits and pieces to keep me going during the day, two ammunition pouches and an expense base for putting in the empties as we fired them. There's no other kit. Brass cartridges. Uh, they would them. have been um, the, the full Martini Henry 0.45 round with a 0.5 um, actual main casing. We don't have any rounds here to show you because we're just using uh, alternative ammunition to make uh -huh. them go bang. That's all it is. So I can't show you what a round looked like. You see, it's just dressed in Victorian soldiers' kits, so boots, leather sold, heavily hobnailed because the British soldier marched everywhere. Leather gaiters to seal our feet and boots and trousers together to stop us from getting all the bits and pieces. Despite their thick leather nature, they're actually quite comfortable to wear and use. Standard artillery trousers, still worn by today's guards. It's still the, there's only piece of equipment that we're wearing now that we still purchase as original. Uh, no pressing in them. The ironing that everybody associates, the creases down the front, didn't come in in the Victorian period. Tunics we have, we have to make, have to make especially because they're no longer available, but the British Army fought and worked in red. Never mind any stories about blood and gore, it's because it was the cheapest colour material to get. Uh, so you see it's in a working dress, the, um, the green facings and collars of an English county regiment. The badges I'm wearing are applicable to what I'm doing with marksmanship, um, one of the unit signallers, the long service tapes. Compensate we've got to get two years, then six years, then the next six years, two for twelve, and six years thereafter. As long as I, as long as I keep them, they can be can be taken off you. Right. Somebody with a lot of long service would earn more money than the Lance Corporal because they had an extra penny a day per tape. So, so that's, that's not rank. That's service. That's not rank. That's service. Oh, right, right. This is rank. Oh, I see. Right. Uh, so really, that's all we're all we're working here. A, a beeswax lime wooden bottle, which in hot climate would leak the water out, so it wasn't particularly effective. And what's this one again? That's marksman. Oh. So you have to qualify on the range to get your marksman's badge again. More pay. So it's worth getting in that respect. <laughs> And then you come back to what everybody knows, the white pith helmet. Mm -hmm. Very effective in hot climates because this unit has been to South Africa and played with the, for want of a better description, with the Zulus. And because the sun over there is almost overhead, there's no problem with sunburn. Your face is in shadow yeah. because the rim around the entire helmet covers your entire face. And as you see, the uniform covers almost your entire body apart from the backs of your hands. Uh, so that's the only place you really caught any sun. So it's very effective. on top, is that? Uh, yep, it is. I'll take the helmet off. You can see there is a vented inside. There is, yeah. Look at that. And it will, and this will, this will screw off. I won't, but you can see I'm actually unscrewing it now. But that is just part and parcel of holding that on because you can see it's screwed into it. So and that's all there. You will see the marks there. We don't wear a um, unit badge on these, not on the campaigns that we're portraying. Although in some places, uh, particularly Canada, where it was more regimental, they would still have the unit badge upon their white helmets. So they would take them off? In yeah, we wouldn't wear them in the field. Oh, right. um, but uh, this is foreign service helmet. We would wear this any foreign service. We wouldn't have our blue helmets with us in Canada. We'd have the white ones. So, um, so really the only difference in the dress that we're wearing on service is the helmet. Everything else is the same. We'd have a cape or great coat, uh, which would normally be carried up, uh, carried rolled up in the small of the back on uh, extra leather work that fits onto what, we were, uh, what I'm wearing today. Uh, really there's not much more to it than that. Um, two ammunition pouches. Yeah, two ammunition pouches. I would have some more ammunition in my backpack if I was carrying it. Right. Uh, I'd carry 60 rounds in total and that was more than sufficient because it wasn't voluntary firing. It was quite slow and controlled and that was ample so that ammunition to last me without any worries at all about what we were running out. Strong free of firing. Uh, the firing it is. The Martini rifle was the first breech loading rifle that the British Army had. The, the troops loved it. Very simple action. Has 
has a lot of followers that they, 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 the troops loved it but it does have some failings. The biggest failing in terms of modern weaponry, there is no safety catch to it. So all the drills associated with it require of handling the weapon with the hand nowhere near the trigger. So to load the weapon, pulling the lever down drops the breech, drops the block rather and exposes the breech. Pulling this down, there's an ejector claw that comes out there. Just doing that, had there have been a round in, it would have ejected it straight out. So clearing the breech. I then put a round in, pull the lever back up, and that weapon is now loaded. And the only way I can tell it's loaded is the position of this lever has changed. That is the only difference between loaded and unloaded. So as soon as you see that in the cock position, some people were strong enough to do that, but it's very, very difficult. Oh, it's not so, actually a lever for you. No, it's not, oh, it's yeah. not to, uh, to cock it. No, that is the way it's cocked like that. So, no safety catch. So that is now loaded. All the handling drawers holding this part or this part of the weapon, hands away from it. Because you would move around with a loaded weapon, but no, not in a position where you would accidentally fire it. Uh, it was some, one of his other failings, this part of the barrel would get extremely hot in use. After half a dozen rounds, it became too hot to hold. No, so if, if you look at the film Zulu or uh, Zulu Dawn, mm -hmm. you'll find that some of the troops have uh, adopted the uh, clutch of sewing a thick leather band around there, <laughs> so insulating the barrel from their hands, so that when they're carrying the rifle at the trail position, which is one of the safety positions, you know, away from the trigger, carried loaded like this, when the barrel was hot, you could still do so without burning your hand. So that's, it's a very effective weapon can be fired very quickly as you can see from those films but it wasn't normally used in that way it's sighted for up to one thousand i think it's 1500 yards although they weren't used at that distance uh, more like 400 yards downwards um what else can i say uh what's this bit that's just, that's, be that's what just going to do. Yeah. Now you'll find that most rifles when you shoot them you're taught to put your hand, thumb over the top like that. One of the drawbacks of this weapon is it did carry quite a substantial charge. There was quite a recoil when firing it. And that is to keep your thumb on the right hand side because the weapon would come so far backwards your thumb would be in contact with your nose and create uh, some very sore injuries. So you're taught from day one to keep your thumb on the right hand side so leaving this spot for your nose to go into when you fire it. So it would actually come back that far. So if your thumb's over this side, thumb and nose meet, not a very happy match, especially when done quickly. So uh, that is really it. Uh, there's not much to say about the rifle, apart from the fact that it's very easily taken down. A soldier in the field could quite happily uh, strip this rifle and clean it, uh, only so far as just taking out these pins and bringing the breech block out, so clearing out inside there. The breech block wouldn't normally be taken apart, which contains the firing pin. You've got a is that for clearing. And yep. Yeah. Um, one of the other failings was the original rolled brass round would, when ejected, sometimes pull the end off the round, leaving the, the, the actual casing still in the, the breech and the barrel. So under those circumstances, the, the, the clearing rod would be brought out which is quite a close fit in the bore, and that would then be just put down to knock out the old round. Okay. And then it would just be put back in. And carry on firing so nothing would happen. And your uh, bayonet? Ah, and the bayonet. Now the bayonet is something that the Victorian soldier was heavily practised in. Uh, they were quite happy to meet their enemies with the bayonet, which at the time, if you think about it, were mainly savages carrying shields and spears. And so uh, it was a very effective weapon. Now, you need to consider that the bayonet is 21 inches of pointed steel. It's not sharp, it's just pointed on the very, on the very end. Yeah. It is a stabbing weapon. And when this is put, it, put on the end of the rifle, as you can see, see it makes a very long spear of our own. Now this I can extend it to that distance there which you can see is a fair way away and the drills I can bring it right back and I can bring them in within arms reach. So it is effective from arms reach to a spread of almost six feet in that one movement like that. Uh, the rest of the drills are you know, taking on just basically just learning to stab people either in trenches or lying on the floor or up here on horseback or protecting yourself from slashes from swords this sort of thing so you, the troop was heavily, heavily trained in it and was more than happy to engage the enemy with it
Uh, in your opinion, one on one with a Zulu warrior? <laughs> Julie's out. <laughs> Let's push this day. I would clear, like to meet one. Yeah. <laughs> Having met them and know just what they're like, um, yeah, he'd have to be a brave soldier, and uh, the Zulu wouldn't come in without any any qualms whatsoever. Yeah. And they're not little wimps; they're quite heavily built people, muscular, and they would come in. Uh, they're used to knocking uh, the enemy's uh, spears aside, so it's just as easy to knock one of these aside. But if you know the tactics of your troops, then you can be ready for it. But uh, we would only engage in bayoneting close range stuff after we've been firing at them. Um, so we've already decimated their numbers and it would be rare for them to come within that range. Although it wasn't unknown and we were quite happy to do so. Have you got a view on the calamity of this and do I know what the, there's been a lot of debate as to? Poor leadership. leadership. It's poor leadership that let the troops down. They couldn't get the ammunition to the them. guns jamming or too no, much smoke? It's just that the troops were spaced too far apart for okay. the ammunition to be brought to them. Um, the camp itself wasn't properly defended, as is shown in the film. And that's why, in other words, all our basic tactics were ignored or, or, or not known by the officer in command. Uh, the walks drift, what you've got is the opposite. You've got the Zulus going in where they were told not to, because they're going to take us a fortified position. Mm -hmm. So they went against the stacked deck, and we went against one at San Luana with the, the, the cards stacked the opposite direction. What? Enemy was underrated. Chelmsford had split his troops before mm -hmm. the enemy's position was properly known, so he's decimated his own troops before they're even under attack. Jam in there. So that one won't go in. I've now got a jam. So he would ignore orders whilst the others are firing yes. off and it would immediately clear them. Yeah, immediate action draws you carry on, that's it, that's it. Now get another round and carry on. It was as quick as that. So you see, problems with jams? No. No. The, the rifle can be cleared quite quickly. So, uh, that's a bit of a fallacy. They did jam, but not very often. Okay. They'd have to be hot before they started jamming. Yeah. And to get them hot, they've been used quite heavily and they weren't used that heavily. They generate a lot of smoke? Yes, that's the black powder that was used in uh, firing them. Um, that's why the wearing of red isn't a problem. Because we were, this is the British Army at the time, you've got to think about the, the mentality of the Victorians. We're fighting for our empire, which we've built up around the world. And we're, we're standing there as if to say, come on if you think you're hard enough. We're standing up and say, here we are, look. And Victorian dress is not the same as modern dress with the army. It's shoulder to shoulder, there are no gaps. This is where you get your thin red, thin red line. Uh, but when you see a wall of red facing you, and then on command they're all told to load, present their rifles and fire, they send a wall of lead towards the enemy. Um, so once they fired, black powder, big plume of smoke, what's the point of trying to remain hidden when as soon as you fire your weapon, you're going to tell everybody where you are by this big cloud of smoke. This big cloud of smoke. That policy had to change with the uniforms and the uh, ammunition we were firing when we started taking on the bowers, oh, who yes. were expert marksmen. Yeah. And so thanks very much for the white spot, uh, white cross to aim at. Yeah. Um, when we were lying on the floor with the, the webbing that we, we also wear, a black mess tin on our backs, aim just beneath the black mess tin and take the kidneys out. <laughs> and there were such marksmen they could do it from horseback. Yeah, Shoot at us a couple of rounds and scarper. Out of our range. And we couldn't hit them as a moving target. We weren't trained as marks, but we get a badge, that's just for qualifying as the required standard. It's not saying we're a sniper. Right, okay. So we were just trying to unvolly fire, bang, but at least put the rifle pointing in the direction where it should be pointing. I think there's not a lot else to say uh, about the kit and equipment, apart from the fact we wear a, uh, a blue a blue woolen shirt underneath this lot. That's right, I well. that. The sick um, had those. But it is, the, despite what you hear some people say, they're not that uncomfortable at all. And in South Africa, we found this uniform more comfortable than in the UK. So over here, when it's sunny, it's also humid. And it's a dry just, heat. Yeah, it's got all hot and sticky. But in South Africa, when you were sweating, which you were, it was dry, it was evaporating as fast as you were losing it which cooled us down and the uniforms remained dry. So it was actually quite comfortable. It surprised us all. Yeah. It completely surprised us. And they would stain their hats of tea? That was a bit later on, that's right. In use at the moment, what you see, this one, it's just got dirty through use. 
Yeah. You can always tell somebody who just come out fresh because they had white, white helmets. It's when you start going on into the Indian campaigns and later on with the Boer War stuff that they started getting tea stained at your crib before, going, before probably going into khaki. No, it was just a, should we say, a halfway measure that the troops adopted just to so they didn't become such a target. Thanks so much. Fascinating stuff.